The title tonight is Alcibiades' Speech in Plato's Symposium, and I'm calling it A Study of Similes. Now, Plato is the great master of analogy, allegory, similes. Nowhere does he use it with such precision and fun as in this speech of Alcibiades. Now it's a very, very lofty purpose because in the symposium, Everybody who's in the symposium, if they take the challenge, have to get up and give a full dress oration in praise of love. Alcibiades comes in after everyone is finished because the speeches go around from left to right and Socrates was the last to speak. And then after Socrates' speech, there's a big uproar and in comes Alcibiades with all his friends and they cause confusion in the party and drinking starts on a pretty heavy scale. And then Alcibiades is forced to get up and now give a speech. And he says, I'm not going to compete against you sober men and give a speech on love or in praise of love. Rather than that, I will give a speech in praise of Socrates. And he says, I will tell the truth about you, Socrates. And Socrates responds, all right, do it. So Alcibiades says, I will praise Socrates and I'll do it with similes. Now, look here. Here's a four-term analogy. A is to B as C is to D. There it is. The rule for making and generating similes is that you must take the alternate terms, either one, take the alternate terms and express that relationship with the word like. If you say A is C, but, and good heavens, you don't have a simile, you have a metaphor, an identity. A simile, therefore, presupposes you can set terms in parallel sequence, such as uh, Socrates, let us say, is to his... Uh, His, pers his exhibiting the logos, right, the logos. As, let us take a, a figure uh, called a, a, a Salinos. Now, Salinos is a figure that craftsmen make and they put them in statuary shops and sell them, and they still sell them today, only they use them for, have a different object involved, but the same idea, which is, there's a figure, and it's a hollow figure, doors, you open up the doors, open up these doors, swing them open, and then you can see figures inside. And invariably there are figures of the gods. Well, people still use them for that purpose. They put divine figures in there in various religions. But this one also has pan pipes. And that's our Salinos figure. So Socrates is the Logos as a Salinos figure 
is to the inner being. So, if that's the case, we can say we can say Socrates is like a Salinos. Now, if Socrates is like a Salinos, then everything that we say about Socrates must find a parallel with a Salinos, or it's not being used exactly. In this dialogue, Alcibiades, in the symposium, Alcibiades and the symposium goes to great length to say again and again in a variety of ways that he is going to tell the truth about Socrates and he's going to do it, he is going to do it through and with the use of similes. Just to give you an idea of it, Alcibiades says, I would not praise a single other person in your presence. Well, very well, do this if you like. Praise Socrates. What's that, says Alcibiades? Am I to have at the man and punish him before your faces? Socrates responds, what? What's your notion, to praise me and raise a laugh? Or what will you do? Alcibiades says, I'll tell the truth. Will you let me? Oh, yes, let you tell the truth. I even command you. <clears throat> I, even <clears throat> pardon me. I even command you to do that. That I'll do it at once, says Alcibiades. Look here, this is what I want you to do. If I say anything that is not true, stop me in the middle and say that I am lying. For I won't tell any, tell any lies if I can help it. Therefore, Socrates doesn't interrupt him in this entire speech. We can go on the assumption that he went along with it. Now, that's the introduction. Every interesting subunit in a Platonic dialogue has its own little introduction, as this did, and I just read it to you. Now, Alcibiades, therefore, is going to suggest not one, but two figures. He's going to say, Socrates is like a Salinos, and Socrates is like a Marci Marcia. Now, Marcy is a satyr. A satyr, as you know, has a particularly uh, sexual proclivity or uh, erotic fancy, and he's also a piper. Well then, everything then that we say about Marcia, let's pull it out here, everything we say about Marcia if Socrates is exactly like a Marcia, then we should find parallels with Socrates. And therefore, we can convert, we can convert that simile, Socrates is like a Marcia, into an extended analogy, and that's what we're gonna do. Now look here, what is so important about this and why are we talking about it? I mean, what's at stake? This is a very interesting question because one of the most interesting questions in the last 50 years in philosophy is to try to separate, if you can, Socrates and Plato. Find a way to distinguish one from the other. Where does one begin and where does the other end? Is it possible that we can find something about Socrates that is unique to him apart from the way Plato describes Socrates. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm going to urge something this evening. I'm going to say, if we can assume just for the evening that Socrates does not stop Alcibiades, and therefore that Alcibiades' use of similes and extended analogies illuminate the qualities and the character of Socrates, then we have a very interesting figure called Socrates. And the real question is whether or not we can still say the same thing that Alcibiades said in this speech. What's so important about that? I'm going to leave that out for the conclusion. That's the conclusion.
That's the conclusion of the speech. The conclusion of the speech is he's going to t explain why he's using the similes, and therefore this speech I break up into these parts. An initial discussion of the Selenos and the Marcia, Alcibiades' own personal reflection with Socrates, then he picks up again the Selenos and the Marcia. Then there's a section which is erotic, right? It's, uh, then it's an introduction into the four qualities of Socrates. And then he returns to the Selenos. He started with it. He returns with it in the end to pull it all together into a very interesting and surprising totality. Let's do it. All right, now. Uh, the most interesting thing is, if you, if you follow it strictly, he says, I am going to use similes because Socrates, right? Um, he said, because he's exactly like a Salinos. Therefore, I can, I'm, it's right to use the image of Salinos because he's exactly like him. Well, you see, if he's exactly like him, then if he's exactly like him, then it's an equivalent. They're the same. Well, Alcibiades, we can pick out, make some very interesting distinctions, and he is not in control, as he should be, with certain images that occupy his thought because that mirrors Alcibiades in real life. That mirrors Alcibiades in real life. In other words, Socrates in this, um, is portrayed by, by, by and through Alcibiades as understood by Plato, as understood by Plato. Therefore, Plato is giving us a view of Socrates through the eyes of Alcibiades, while at the same time indicating Alcibiades' weakness and his strengths. So we have to pick out his weaknesses and his strengths. And we can do that. Let's do it. First, um, I just described a short few minutes ago the figure of the Salinos, therefore I can just drop down to the Marcia. Right? He says, you know what, you are Socrates, you're just like a Marcia. You're a bully and you're a piper. Now this is the way he lines up the qualities. Six of them. Six qualities. Here they are. You bewitch men, right? Marcia bewitches men. He uses an instrument, a pipe. It's through the power of his mouth that he's able to create what he does. His tunes, the tunes he plays, are said to be divine. Any good artist who plays them is able to create the same effect, even a common piping girl. What does it do? It awakens the need for people's interest in the gods and the mysteries. His music is so divine that it awakens up in them the need for the mysteries. Of course, that's the Eleusinian mysteries. And their interest in the divine, it wakes them up. Okay. That's the Marcia. That's the Marcia. Now, if that's the Marcia, uh, well, okay, let me put it this way. I'll call this line Socrates. All right. Now, notice what he does. For each one of these points, he's going to have a parallel. He's going to have a parallel. And he said, all right, now remember what he said before, he said, I'm going to use a simile ex ex in its exactness. I'm going to use it exactly, but he doesn't. And that's the whole key to the speech. He said, you, Socrates, you bewitch men, but you enravish them. You overwhelm them. Well, that's, see, now you have to ask yourself, what is greater, to bewitch men or to enravish them. What has a greater impact? To overwhelm them 
Well, I'll let you figure that out. Right? He says, but you don't use any, you, you don't use any instrument because all you use is your own words. You don't use an instrument, only the power of your voice. And therefore, you are, he says, you do it with bare words. And not only that, but anyone, even a poor speaker who uses your words, can produce the same effect. But with a Marcia figure, it was only those who knew music, those who were really, uh, as he called them, uh, good artists or even the common piping girl. Not so for the, the comparison with Socrates. Anybody, even a poor speaker who uses the same words, can have a far greater impact. He said, therefore, he said, uh, he, he now shifts gears and he says, I want to tell you what it does for me, the effect it has on me. So now he's talking personally. And he said, oh, he said, this Socrates is terrible. He says, he said, the effect it has me is worse than in the most frantic revelers. He said, I'm totally overcome by your words. He said, tears flow. Crowds of people are similar in a similar state as I am. What do we do? As a consequence of the dialogues with Socrates, he says, uh, I end up regretting, I regret so much of my life and my slavish condition. And I come to the conclusion, he says, that the life I was living is not worth living. The very life I was leading is not worth living. Far greater than a Marcia. He says, but what happens, he says, well, I'll tell you what happens. He says, I run away from Socrates because to stay there means I'm going to have to sit there and be around that man. And the applause, the public applause is too much for me and I get up and I run as fast as I can away from Socrates. As a matter of fact, he says, you know, uh, when I talked to him, he said, I'm ashamed very much about what I've done and where I am. And I'm rather glad to see him dead. Though he says I'd be weeping, the first one among them all. So he said, I'm stuck. He says, now look here. He says, he puts many people in the same state. Now he says, here's another likeness to my simile. He says, now he goes back, you see, to pick up the Salinos just a little bit, and then he drops it. He hasn't used it at all yet. All he's been doing is using the Marcia. So let me just give you just one line that he's using. He said, the pipings of this satyr have put many others into the same state as me. But let me tell you something else to show you how like he is to my simile and how wonderful his power. As I assure you that not one of you knows this man, but I will show you since I have begun. Right? I will show you since I have begun. Now, in doing that, he shifts and moves from the Marcia to the Salinos. You see, of course, and here's where he's into still on the Salinos, and then he's going to shift entirely out of it. You see, of course, that Socrates has a loving eye for beauty, satyr. He's always interested in such people and quite smitten with them. And again, he's ignorant of everything and knows nothing. That's his pose. Isn't that silenosity? Very much so. He wraps that around him like a cloak like the outside of a carved Salinos figure. But inside, when he's opened up, what do you think he's full of? He's full of temperance or cool-headedness. I'll tell you what's, what's in there. Cool-headedness, they call it temperance in the book. But we don't use that word. Right. So it's an even-mindedness, even very much like what we mean when we say keep your cool. No. Is that what Socrates is? He says, that's what he, he says, I caught a glimpse of it once. 
And now he's going to tell what he means by keeping his cool. And what he does here is to describe himself in terms of trying to seduce Socrates. So he says, I'll tell you what I did at first. He said, I tried to create all of those scenes in which Socrates would come and he said, I'd fix it so that no one was around, you know. He said, I'd, I'd try to make it appear, therefore, as an accident so that then Socrates and I, he said, would become involved erotically and then I could learn everything I could from him and therefore my own growth would be assured. So, in the beginning then, he poses then as the beloved and he wants Socrates then to advance and be the lover and it fails and he talks about how it failed and he says therefore he said I decided to take greater measures now he turns around and now he becomes the pursuer he becomes right he here, right? here's Socrates the beloved here's Alcibiades Pardon me. Ah, he starts out as a beloved and he wants Socrates to pursue him. That doesn't work, so he changes and he becomes the lover <clears throat> in hot pursuit of Socrates. So now he wants Socrates to be the beloved and now he does everything he can to try to seduce him. And he describes meeting late at night. <clears throat> Only Socrates always finds a way to get out. And this one night he was able to make him stay overnight, but nothing came of it. Now, is that an example of being able to keep your cool? Well, Alcibiades thought a great deal of his beauty. So, let me just... Though I had done all this, yet this man was so much above me and so despised me and laughed at my bloom and insulted me at the point where I did think I was something. Gentlemen of the jury, for, gentle, for jury you are, to get a, a verdict on the super imperviosity of Socrates. That I swear by the gods, I swear by the goddesses. When I got up, I had no more slept with Socrates than if I had with a father or an elder brother. How do you think I felt after that? I thought I had been disgraced, yet I admired this man. I admired the way this man was made. Now he uses four terms for his temperance, his courage, wisdom, and endurance. All right. Courage. All right. Wisdom. Endurance. <clears throat> now, anyone reading the dialogue now has to see in this account where you can find evidence for those four virtues. Temperance, courage, endurance, wisdom. So at this point, the reader then must search in every place he can until the end of it to see for the kinds of things that would correspond with each one of these so we can say we now know Socrates at least under those four qualities. Well, that's the fun in reading Plato. So the first thing he does is he talks about what happened during the service, when he was in the service. And he said, Socrates and I were at Podadiah, the great battlefield, and he was better at bearing hardships more than anyone else. Went without food, right? Nothing for his endurance. And he said, by the way, when there's plenty of good cheer and wine, he drank everyone under the table and it never affected him. No one has ever seen Socrates drunk. He said, but I'll tell you even worse, more than that. In the cold, with the snow on the ground and everyone else was bundled, Socrates went around without any shoes, without any sandals. He'd walk on the snow. Now, clearly, that's endurance. 
So we have several examples of endurance. Then he's going to give us some examples of courage. Notice he called it keeping his cool or temperance because Socrates was able to maintain himself in this and didn't participate in the seduction. So we'll call that, as far as Alcibiades is concerned, a, a kind of keeping your cool or temperance. But we want to see where this is, where wisdom is. Let me give you a sidelight to this problem of wisdom. In the symposium of which this is a part, Socrates' teacher is Diotima, a woman. And she takes Socrates through a teaching about the very nature of love that culminates in Diotima outlining a series of steps, a yoga. And she says, you know, I don't know whether, Socrates, you'll be able to achieve that but I'll instruct you, she says, I'll instruct you. And in this description of the steps leading to a vision, it's a vision of beauty itself, what's most significant about that is that we have no way of knowing whether Socrates ever did it. Because all she does is take him as far as understanding is. She tells him, but we don't see that he did it. This is a kind of uh, intellectual tantra yoga since it involves at many steps a physical love. Now, Socrates later then becomes a teacher to Agathon. If he does become a teacher of Agathon, is it because he did achieve that vision? Because Diotima is the master of the entire process. We don't know that. Let me put it another way. In the symposium, the key stages are knowledge or wisdom, understanding, right? right opinion, ignorance. Now, that's an ignorance, a special kind of ignorance. That's when you don't know that you are not, not that's an ignorance, pardon me, that's an ignorance where you don't realize you need something and what you really need is knowledge and wisdom. And you don't know that you really need beauty and even though you may appear beautiful, you haven't yet seen the very nature of beauty. You are ignorant of those things. Ignorant of beauty itself, of knowledge. Because you think you're good enough and you don't need it, that's called ignorance. So Socrates starts out with Agathon, and they both start out in this state of not knowing. Socrates, therefore, has to go through each one of these stages. And in the dialogue, we see him going from ignorance to right opinions. And from right opinions, we see that he goes to understanding. We do not see him going from understanding to knowledge or wisdom. Therefore, if Alcibiades in some way can attest to Socrates' wisdom, in what kind of state is it that he would be able to affirm that someone else is wise? But now look here, there's something peculiar about Alcibiades. I'd like to go back to it so you can keep it fresh in your mind. When he gives his personal statement, look what he says. When I heard Pericles and other good orators, I thought them fine speakers and I felt nothing like that. No confusion in my soul or regret for my slavish condition. But this Marcia here 
has brought me very often into such a condition that I thought the life I led was not worth living. And that, Socrates, you will not say is untrue. And even now at this moment, I know in my conscience that I would not. That, right? And even now at this moment, I know in my own conscience that if I would open my ears, I could never hold out. But I should be in the same state where he compels me to admit that I'm very amiss. Very amiss and not going on neglecting my own self but attending to Athenian and public business. So I force myself. I stop my ears and off I go running as, as from the sirens or else I'd sit down at the very spot besides him until I become an old man. I feel towards this one man something which uh, no one would ever think could be in me to be ashamed before anybody. But I am ashamed before him and before no one else. For I know in my conscience that I cannot contradict him and say it is not my duty to do what he tells me. Yet when I leave him, public applause is too much for me. So I show my heels and run from him. And whenever I see him, I feel ashamed of what I confess to him. Often enough, I should be glad to see him no longer among mankind. But should that happen, I am sure I would uh, be sorrier still, so I don't know what to do with this fellow. So how, see, if he runs from him, what's the point, see? If he runs from him and doesn't therefore learn from him, the whole question is a very simple one. In this relationship, right, did Socrates need his teacher, Diotima? That's the issue, see? If so, and now Socrates becomes the teacher, and Agathon ran away from him, well then, he doesn't have the faintest idea of what knowledge and wisdom is since he left the relationship, was deprived of an opportunity to gain that vision, didn't gain it, therefore how can he possibly judge whether Socrates did or did not achieve this curious thing called wisdom, which is very important for us to understand. That's the problem. Let's see if we can solve it. Now, here is where we're going to have to play with the problem of inference. And have to use what we can. Now, he's talking about endurance, and then he shifts, and let me do it for you. Yet when there was plenty of good cheer, he was the only one who could really enjoy it. Particularly, although he didn't care for drinking, when he was compelled to drink, he beat them all. And what is most wonderful of all, no one in the world has ever seen Socrates drunk. That we should be able to test presently, as I think. That was not all. In his endurance of the cold winter, the winters were dreadful there, he did wonders. And here is a specimen. Once there was a most dreadful frost, and no one could go out of doors. Or if they did, they put on an awful lot of things. Right. Wrapped up the feet, and felt and sheepskin. But this man went out in that weather wearing only such a cloak as he used to wear before. And Unshod, he marched over the ice more easily than others with boots on. While the soldiers looked at him thinking he despised them. Ah, so much for that. Once on that expedition, and it is worth hearing, he got some notion into his head, and there he stood on one spot from dawn thinking. And when it didn't come out, he would not give up, but he stood still pondering. It was already midday, and people noticed it and wondered, and said to one another that Socrates had been standing, thinking about something since dawn. Well, at last, 
At last, when evening came, some of the Ionians, right, after dinner, it was summertime then, brought out their pallets and slept near in the cool. They watched him from time to time to see if he'd stand all night. He did. He stood until it was dawn and the sun rose. And then he offered a prayer to the sun and walked away. Now what's that? You see? Everybody saw him. That's a 24 hours. Huh? Standing in one spot. Engrossed in whatever it was he was. Well, I would say that uh, anybody who can do that for 24 hours, absorbed in a thought, is contemplating. In the steps leading to this vision of beauty, you are compelled to contemplate. It's a necessary step in this course for the vision of beauty. Compelled to contemplate. Here we have an example of Socrates contemplating. So absorbed that he can stay in that state for 24 hours. I would submit that that's a Maha Samadhi state, a great Samadhi state. Alcibiades, can't appreciate it. He just says, well, Socrates is just there trying to think something out. Well, you can certainly think something out without standing in one spot for 24 hours. You can sit down, lie down, you can do a variety of things. You can walk. He fixed himself in one plot, spot and stood there. Now, in this great dialogue, there is that great myth of poverty and plenty and love. In the description of love, or eros, right, the father and mother of eros, father is called plenty, the mother is called uh, poverty. And the myth, as you know, it's a great, magnificent party. They're celebrating the birth of, of Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. And she's in the doorway. She has her eyes on plenty. And he's drinking some nectar. And he passes out from it. And uh, she sees a great opportunity. And so she lies with him and conceives Eros. And so Eros is born. And as a consequence, becomes the attendant follower of the goddess Aphrodite, who is divine beauty. In any case, if we looked at the description of Eros and marked them all down and went back into the dialogue to see how many of these are being used to describe Eros equally apply to Socrates. Look here. If for this entire list we can find Socrates, Eros, for every time Eros is mentioned and described, if we can list all of the qualities, then look to see if we can find the same set used to describe Socrates, then we'll say something interesting about the speech Socrates gave. He then personifies Eros. One of the key and peculiar points about Eros is that he's described as unshod, sleeping in the open airs. Right? Now, sleeping in the open airs, always in want, and pursuing beauty. If we went back into this, we could then line up the particular qualities that Alcibiades uses to describe Socrates and line them up with Eros. These will be the key qualities that will allow us to define 
the fact that Socrates is functioning as Eros. Ah, let's go back now. The question then would be whether or not this would constitute a Mahasamadhi, an insight into the very nature of reality, because in this dialogue, that high vision of beauty is equivalent to an insight into the nature of the truth of reality. That's the way it's described. Oh. Alcibiades doesn't use this language. He never got close enough to it. We as readers have to see whether we can understand it this way by piecing all of these things together. Now, courage. Watch what he does with courage. That's easy enough. He doesn't have any trouble with that. So he talks about a campaign that he went on, and uh, Socrates was really great in a battle, and he said, you know what? He said, uh, Socrates was going to get this medal for valor, and Socrates persuaded the generals that he shouldn't have it, but Alcibiades should have it. So Alcibiades says, can you imagine that? Therefore, they pinned the medals on me. It should have belonged to him. Then he describes how Socrates is in, was in battle and how he kept his cool in the middle of danger. Therefore, we have enough evidence that he is, in fact, courageous. I saw how he kept his head much better than I. Uh, he's much better than Laches, who was a really great warrior. So he said, no one, no one, no one did better in courage. Now, I would like to now go to the conclusion. And therefore, Socrates, because of the way he walked, the way he carried himself in the middle of battle, he got off safe. Both this man and his companion. For in war, when men are like that, people usually don't touch them with a finger, but pursue those who are running headlong. Now I'd like to spend some time now at these last two paragraphs, where now he's going to go back to the Silenos. And what I think are really two of the greatest paragraphs in all of Socrates or Platonic writings. Now he stops and he reflects. Reflect with me now, okay? One could quote many other things in praise of Socrates. Wonderful things. Of his, of his other habits, one might perhaps say much the same about another man. And yet, it is in his not being like any other man in the world, ancient or modern, that is worthy of all wonder. Men like Achilles might be found. One might take, for example, Brasidas and others, and again, men like Pericles, or such as Nestor, and Antenor, and there are many more besides. And so we might go on with our comparisons. But as for this man, so odd, both the man and his talk, none could ever be found to come near him, neither modern nor ancient, unless he is to be compared to no man at all, but to the Salinas's and the satyrs to which I have compared him and his talk. So, as far as he's concerned, no comparison with any man, ancient or modern. Now he's going to pull it together. He's going back to the Salinas figure and notice the way he's able to do this. For indeed, there is something which I left out when I began that even his talk is very like the opening Salinas's. When you agree to listen to the talk of Socrates, it might seem at first to be nothing but absurdity. Such words and phrases are wrapped outside it like the hide of a boisterous satyr. Pack asses, smiths, shoemakers, tanners, not what he talks about. 
And he seems to be always saying the same things in the same words, so that any ignorant and foolish man would laugh at them. But when they are opened out and you get inside them, you will find his words first full of sense, as no others are, next most divine and containing the finest images of virtue excellence, and reaching furthest, in fact, reaching to everything which it profits a man to study who is to become noble and good. So when you open up Socrates, the Salinos now, going back to the Salinos figure, what do you find? You have to get, what do you, you have to get inside them, right? You have to get inside the words because his words are full of sense, right? They make good sense. And they're most divine and containing the finest images of virtue or excellence. Salinos figures inside are divine. You open them up, this is what you find. Open up Socrates' words, and what do you find? A ah, great deal of, of sense, common sense, high sense. His uh, images are most divine, containing the finest images of virtue or excellence. And what are they good for? Reaching, in fact, to everything which it profits a man who is to become noble and good. Now, That's the quest of the entire symposium. What kind of excellence is it that you need to gain this vision? And how is it related to the Logos? Well, Alcibiades didn't stay long enough for this because in these steps, there are four stages of the development of the Logos. If we can take those four, we can then pull them together to see that that's what Alcibiades is alluding to when he talks about the words of Socrates, right? containing the finest images of virtue or excellence and reaching as far as uh, is possible for any man who wants to reach the good, the noble and the good. So let me shift gears and go back into the speech. What do I want to do now? I want to go take a look at these steps leading to this vision. And it's the very famous section at approximately 207 uh, C. Um, and it... Uh, um, or actually 209, 209, I'll go there, <clears throat> uh, 209E, as it's called in the uh, Stephanus numbering system. If his leader leads aright, he should love one body and there beget beautiful speech, <clears throat> right? Beget beautiful speech. It goes a couple of more steps. Right. He should believe in the beauty of souls to be more, more precious than beauty in the body. So that if anyone is decent in soul, even if it has a little bloom, it would be enough for him to love and care for, and to beget and seek such talks as will make young people better, too. Yeah. Then he has a very interesting one, the last stage, the third one. He should then turn to the great ocean of beauty and in contemplation of it give birth to many beautiful and magnificent speeches and thoughts in the abundance of philosophy. Why? 
because that strengthens the individual and from that they gain a growth. They need two things. They need to grow and gain strength so they can catch sight of that vision of beauty. Third kind. Now, we're on the last step and he's just having that vision of beauty, and this is the way he describes it. Do you not reflect that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind, which alone can see it, to give birth not to likenesses of virtue, since he touches no likeness, but to reality, since he touches reality. And when he has given birth to real virtue or excellence and brought it up, will it not be granted to him to be the friend of God and immortal if any man ever is? So what does he do? We have all of the same words. So Alcibiades can recognize the themes, but he doesn't yet recognize his role in participating in them since he runs away as fast as he can but we did want to see the relationship between the two. So, you will find his words full of sense, as no others are, most divine and containing the finest images of excellence or virtue, and reach, reaching furthest, in fact, reaching to everything which it profits a man to study is to become noble and good. So therefore, in running up those steps, he finally then gains that vision reaches that kind of excellence, touches the nature of ultimate reality, and after that he has to bring up, bring to birth real excellence and bring it up and nurture it. That nurturing and bringing it up means he has to give birth to it. So the entire speech of the symposium is Socrates' contribution of sharing his own vision to every, with everyone. That is to say, the symposium we find the birth of philosophy. That's what it is. Where philosophy's primary goal uh, is to master the logos, the word, so that therefore we can be led to these kinds of visions of beauty. So Alcibiades is going to tell us the truth about Socrates. Now, what is the truth about Socrates is he is revealing? He's telling us a lot about him that's peripheral, but the one thing he gives us that interests us most is this great contemplative state Socrates got in, which we are saying is equivalent to the great Maha Samadhi, and that is the experience of ultimate reality or wisdom. What else does he give us? He gives us this challenge. If we can take these words as seriously as perhaps they were intended in this speech, then the conclusion is Alcibiades, which is, yet he's not being like any other man in the world, ancient or modern. And that's worthy of all wonder. Therefore, you have to liken him to the similes, the Marcia and the Salinos. Because when you get into his words and open them up, well, that's what you find, the images of good sense, find the most divine, and containing the finest images of virtue or excellence. And that's what he's done through the speech. So that's what I wanted to share with you, this exploration of Alcibiades' speech. <clears throat> and in the conclusion of the symposium of Socrates' speech, he says that this thing that is born between he and his teacher, Diotima, right, we'll take this out, we'll make this Diotima and this Socrates. He says, the child of their relationship, 
can rival the children of Homer and Hesed. Homer and Hesed are considered the, the sacred scriptures, as it were, of the Greeks. So there's a child of their relationship, Socrates then is discussing in the symposium, and that is philosophy, which Socrates is giving forth, or through Plato, is saying this thing that we're giving birth to, which is philosophy, we believe can compete against Homer and Hesiod and go on with all of that implicit greatness and live on and on. That's the speech of Alcibiades and Socrates' uh, or Plato's dialogue, the symposium, and that's what I wanted to play with this evening. So let me throw it open to you. First, I'm always glad to do this because this is what I think is really a great speech, Alcibiades' his great speech to Socrates. <clears throat> In the myth about the poverty, plenty. Yeah, is there? That seems to be a theme that we dabbled in last week. The the union of opposites. Is there? Is there something to that? Poverty and plenty are opposites. Right. Right. They are opposites. They are opposites. Um, I was thinking back from last week when you were talking about the opposites um, in the stage, uh, what was it, the, the one, and you were talking about the, the limit and the limitless, mm -hmm. and, then to, mm -hmm. and within that is the being, when those two come together. I was just, was just wondering, curious, if there was any Yes, because <clears throat> like these are <clears throat> these are opposites, but they don't stand as opposed because they come together and create something between them, which is eros. But the qualities they have are opposite. See the curious thing about this whole myth and the whole symposium is that it's attempting to give an exploration of how can we account for the existence of love in the universe? Where did it come from? How is it that the universe is so constructed that there is love? The way they talk about that is personify love personify it. Now talk about love's parents. We'll call one poverty, his mother, plenty, his father. Now we can create a myth because we can personify all of the qualities which we think must exist to be brought together in some way to produce this thing called love. But those qualities cannot come together were it not for the fact that the gods are celebrating the birth, it's the birth of Aphrodite. On the very day when they're celebrating the birth of Aphrodite, love comes into existence. Because love is the love of the beautiful. So therefore, beauty must come into existence. 
And as soon as that beauty comes into existence, immediately there must be a desire for it. And the desire for it can be represented by eros. But how did that ever take place? There must again have been some things, as it were, in the very structure of reality that were lying dormant until the birth of Aphrodite occurs. Now, what's the birth of Aphrodite? Metaphysically, in the Platonic world, the birth of Aphrodite, that is the birth of, or the, uh, you can say, the coming, coming into existence of this. However, however that vision of beauty occurs, that's divine beauty, Aphrodite. Whatever is the cause of this coming into existence, whatever that is, the very day it came into existence, it must have awoke, it must have awoke, awoke whatever was conscious of its immense beauty and therefore it created a need, a desire for it, since it lacked it. And therefore the pursuit, the pursuit of what is regarded as beautiful is love. So on the very same day that divine beauty came into existence, same time Eros came into existence. Therefore when Eros comes into existence, he's the follower he attends Aphrodite, pursues and attends her. And these are uh, opposites. So Socrates in this dialogue, uh, in one way, in one way, if we lay, had some time, we could lay it out, Socrates exhibits all of the qualities of each of these in different parts of the dialogue. And this may in fact be that kind of an occasion that we talked about right here in that deepest state of contemplation. Passes out, the drink is nectar, which means deathless. That's the drink of immortality. And Socrates at the end of his speech says, through that he becomes a friend of the gods and immortal if any man ever is. And therefore, this culminates in this, according to Socrates' speech when he's quoting Diotima. Now, out of that experience, remember what we said? Then one must, so it, it doesn't end with that vision, but something has to come out of it. There has to be something creative. And so what does he say? He says, oh. Do you not reflect that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind which alone can see it? And to give birth not to likenesses of virtue, since he touches no likeness, but to reality, since he touches reality. And when he's given birth to real excellence and brought it up, will it not be granted him to be a friend of God and immortal if any man ever is? So, um, the, this is the drink of immortality but out of it, there must be something. There has to be something that's nurtured, that's developed, that comes out of it, which he calls excellence. There has to be an excellence that emerges from it. It has to be shown. It must be exhibited. And that's what Socrates is doing in the everyday world. He's exhibiting that kind of excellence that he gained through those kinds of states, through those kinds of teachers he brought together and discussed in the symposium. Kind of an amazing piece of work. And to whatever, to whatever degree it uh, captures the soul, as it were, of Socrates, uh, maybe he is like no one in the modern or ancient world. <laughs> it's 
So, thank you much for letting me uh, go over it. I always enjoy doing it. <laughs>